In this week's class, we're going to be talking about the diversity of life, uh, simple organisms. First, we're going to talk a little bit about classification. Classification helps you organize, and organization helps you with study. Because, you know, like things are probably going to have similar characteristics. Um, in the natural selection uh, simulation, you were told that you did a phylogenetic classification. And you, you did, but you sort of didn't. Um, because phylogenetic classification is actually an older system. Uh, the, it's based on the basic characteristics of life, like tissue, metabolism, the reproduction, the kind of habitat, the way animals move and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and back then uh, we used to actually have five different kingdoms that we distinguished. Um, these classification systems occasionally get updated as we know more stuff. That's one of the things about scientists. Um, when we know more, um, we will change our minds about things. And so we have now um, discovered that there's a much better way to look at um, this classification. And we're looking at the genetic uh, homology, the DNA homology of the ribosome, um, which is part of the protein th synthesis machinery and is highly conserved from all the way, the bacteria, all the way to us. And based on that, we now um, have a different kind of uh, classification that we actually call phonetic classification. And the simulation sort of skimmed over that, um, where we have three domains, um, two prokaryotic uh, domains, which are single, simple single cell um, organisms that have no nucleus or organelles, and we'll talk about what prokaryotes are in just a second. There are the archaea, or extremophiles, and then the bacteria, which are both the bacteria and the blue-green algae. Um, we used to lump those together um, because, you know, they're all small and round and, you know, microscopic, who cares? Um, but as we have looked at their DNA, we realized that they are as widely differentiated between them um, as we are from, you know, from them, basically. So they're a much, much larger group than we ever thought. So they got to have their own domain. And then the third domain is the eukaryotes. Those have nucleus and organelles. Um, in the eukaryotes, in the eukarya, um, we have a couple of different kingdoms. We have the protists, which is a very diverse group. Uh, it goes from simple unicellular organisms to multicellular organisms. Um, we have fungi, we have plantae, and we have animalia. We're going to talk about the protists and the fungi today. We're going to talk about the animalia oh, also this week. Um, and then we're going to talk about the plantae. So animalia is the next lecture, but plenty is, is the next, the lecture after that. So when you look at prokaryotic cells, those are the bacteria and the archaea. Um, they're single-celled organisms. They're between one and 10 micrometer in size. Uh, remember looking at a ruler? Um, when you looked at that little millimeter mark, which is those 10 little divisions within a centimeter, um, it's thousands to hundreds of that. Um, the DNA is usually circular. There are very few cellular structures on the inside and they divide by binary fission. A eukaryotic cells, those are plant and animal cells. Those are the cells in multicellular organisms. Uh, they're between 10 and 100 times as big as uh, prokaryotic cells. And over here, I put a... Um, eukaryotic cell in there as a uh, as just a little show and tell um, what this looks like. In eukaryotic cells, the DNA is in the nucleus. Um, they have organelles, uh, and they divide by mitosis and meiosis, and we already talked about that. The, um, the thing about eukaryotic cells, uh, the, the issue with eukaryotic cells is they're so big 
um, bacteria are small enough that most everything can still happen with diffusion. Um, as we'll find out, or as you find out in, in biology class in 112, a lot of things in your body also still happen with diffusion. But diffusion doesn't work well in long distances. It only works well in short distances. And so what you have to do is you have to have structures uh, that bring things together um, closer so that diffusion can still work. Uh, so that's why eukaryotic cells have structures that are internally um, to the other structures. Um, one of the very interesting uh, um, things inside of a eukaryotic cell are, for example, the mitochondria, which are the powerhouses of the cell. Um, those are about the size of a bacterium because we think they came from bacteria. And there's a lot of evidence for that. They have their own DNA. Um, they have a double membrane. So there are lots of reasons to think that they that we hijacked an organism at some point in the past um, that, that would provide us with energy, which clearly is a selective advantage uh, for natural selection. So, because um, you're way more energetically rich than other, than other creatures. So that's, that's a thing. So when we look at the uh, domain archaea, they're prokaryotes, um, there may be as much as 20% of the total biomass of the, um, of the earth um, they um, have some enzymes that are similar to eukaryotes. A lot of them have unique uh, cell membranes. They have a lot of unique things anyway. They, um, they're also called extremophiles. Um, they live in very extreme environments. They can exploit a variety of energy sources, um, sulfur, ammonia, sunlight. Some of them, I think, use um, arsenic um for for energy so it's it's amazing um in in years when we do the termite lab um we talk about that they actually are involved in a um collaborative uh in a mutualistic relationship with the protozoan and we're going to talk about what protozoa are um in um in the cellulite digestion in termites and in ruminants which cows are So the domain bacteria, um, they're also prokaryotic, which means that they don't have a membrane-bound nucleus or organelles. Um, they divide by binary fission. They're generally smaller than eukaryotic cells. Um, they're single celled and we um, organize them by their basic shapes. So bacilli are rods, poxi are little, little spheres, spirilla are corkscrews, and then colonies, um, those are clusters that, um, and, and those are created by the way they divide. Um, so clusters often have the prefix staphylo and chains have the prefix strepto. So when you, when you look at a bacterial name, a lot of times you can already tell what it looks like. So your staphylococcus aureus is going to be a round coccus Staphylo in like clusters, and the aureus part actually means golden. So Staphylococcus aureus is um, something that, when you grow it in culture, makes little um, yellow colonies. Now, what what are you know what's the what's the um, the role of bacteria? Um, bacteria in your garden. Um, they are responsible for nitrogen fixation for plants. So uh, plants really need them for that. Um, they also help with the decay of the organic matter. 10% um, of your body weight could be bacteria. Um, a lot of them are opportunistic pathogens, which means that they're normally not causing disease, uh, but then they can under you know, so certain circumstances um, become disease causing. The um, on the skin, uh, the kind of um, bacteria that, that you've probably heard about, there's Staphylococcus epidermidis, which epidermidis, that's your skin. Um, Staph aureus, Staphylococcus aureus. Um, that's uh, the one that uh, causes methicillin resistant um, Staph aureus, uh, necrotizing fasciitis. Uh, toxic shock syndrome, 
Um, nosocomial infections, those are hospital acquired infections. Uh, it can also cause food poisoning. Uh, Streptococcus pyogenes uh, causes skin infection, necrotizing fasciitis, strep throat, um, scarlet fever. Scarlet fever is actually um, very similar to strep throat. There's, there's uh, the, the bacterium simply carries an extra factor. Um, it also can cause acute rheum uh, rheumatic fever um, and temporary OCD in children. Uh, Streptococcus pneumoniae um, causes things like bacterial pneumonia, otitis media, uh, meningitis. Then there's Streptococcus mutans. It's uh, involved in plaque formation and uh, dental caries. The um, Part of your normal flora are things like in the small uh, intestines, you have lactobacilli. Um, those are in your GI gastrointestinal tract and in the vagina. In the large intestine, you have bacterioides. Most of them are mutualistic with us. Uh, they help us process polysaccharides. So like your beans and that kind of stuff. Um, this is why the more beans you eat, the better you get at digesting them because you're literally growing the bacteria that help you digest them. Um, but there are also opportunistic human pathogens that can make you sick if, if you have like GI surgery infections. Um, and then there are the enterobacteriaceae, um, mainly Escherichia coli. Escherichia coli is a magical little thing. Um, we use it in research all the time. E. coli makes so many things for us. It's amazing. Um, but there are some serotypes uh, like the 0175, 157 H7, which causes hemorrhagic colitis um, and may require hospitalization. So when bacteria are pathogenic, um, we have an innate immune system uh, that, that fights it for us, right? Um, so we've got physical and chemical barriers. Uh, so our skin is a barrier, for example, the saltiness of our skin doesn't let very many um, bacteria live on it. Um, then you're the, the orifices that are open, your eyes and your mouth. Um, there's lysozyme in your tears. Uh, that can wash out bacteria. Um, your body is constantly fighting bacteria. They get trapped in the mucus. Um, there are cilia in your um, in your um, airways and, uh, and and other places that toss them back out. Um, even if they manage to get into your body, um, very few of them survive the stomach acid. Um, so so there are lots and lots of ways how your immune system. Um, beats down bacteria um, all the time. So, so um, you're, if, if your immune system were not able to beat down bacteria, you would die by brushing your teeth. Um, so, you know, when people say this mask wearing wears down your immune system, that's just silliness. Um, there are also specialized cells that eat up bacteria. They recognize shapes on the outside of the bacteria. And uh, these special cells like macrophages, they patrol your cells all the time. Um, and then there are other cells that call in cytokines and other signal molecules that then, you know, get more cells to help with, with fighting the intruder. Um, if our immune system gets overwhelmed, we have things like antibiotics. And what antibiotics do, they take advantage of the fact that bacteria are different from us. So we can fight bacteria um, with antibiotics um, because there are parts of bacteria that we don't have. So bacteria, for example, uh, some of them, not all of them, have a peptidoglycan cell wall. And one of the stains you're gonna be looking at today is a gram stain. We're gonna look at that in just, in just a minute. So peptidoglycan wall is, is gonna become important. And so there are some bacteria, bacteria, some antibiotics, mostly the penicillins, uh, your bacitracin, for example, um, that are um, capable of, of interfering with the, with the peptidoglycan synthesis. So gram-positive bacteria, like, for example, your staph and your strep, um, those are both gram-positive bacteria, um, meaning they have a very thick peptidoglycan wall. Um, they are sensitive to bacitracin and, and the penicillins. 
So when you have strep throat, um, you'll get a penicillin derivative as a first line of defense. Um, when you have an ear infection, the same kind of thing happens. Um, your, the other bacteria that don't have a thick peptidoglycan wall, they're called gram-negative bacteria. And like I said, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, about that in just a second. Um, other things that we, um, we can inhibit with bacteria that, that antibiotics can fight where bacteria are different from us is they, have, uh, they use different kind of uh, ribosomes. They have a 30S and a 50S ribosome and different, back, uh, different um, antibiotics fight, fight that. Um, so they, they interfere with nucleic acid, acid synthesis, which is different in bacteria from us. Um, antibiotics work with bacteria because a bacteria have these features that are different from us. Antibiotics don't work with viruses because what viruses do, viruses aren't alive by themselves. They're only alive enough to enter the cell and then they hijack our system um, to make more of themselves, which means that what, what you fight is yourself, which is why viral diseases are so difficult to fight because your body, you're literally fighting your own body and your body literally in order to fight the virus has to destroy the cells that are virus making machines. And then if you're destroying the wrong cells that you may need to have to have for like, oh, I don't know, breathing, um, that's a problem, which is our why, why by and large, our best defense for viral diseases, if we can do it, are vaccinations. So let's go on to a couple of other types of bacteria. Uh, there are the cyanobacteria, they're also called blue-green algae. Um, they're green, which means they're most likely photosynthetic. Um, which means they um, add oxygen to the atmosphere. Um, they can also form structures that are actually visible with the naked eye. This is years and years and years and years of stromatolite lights, which are cyanobacteria that just kind of dried over, over the years. Um, you can find them in lakes and ponds and even in oceans. And this is a, um, a picture of an algal bloom um, in, in, I think it's the Bering Strait. Um, there can be unicellular or colonial species. Um, this uh, example here is Oscillatoria. Um, it's uh, a colonial species, so it's filamentous. And each of these little divisions right here, each of these little, that's a cell. Each one of these little things is a cell. Um, now they have um, heterocysts, um, which is, um, which fix, fix nitrogen um, that are um, special. Um, so those are uh, specialized. And we think um, that the chloroplasts in eukaryotic plants may actually have been involved from uh, cyanobacteria, similarly um, to how mitochondria were hijacked. Uh, that theory is called the endosymbiont theory. And then we get to the eukarya. So eukarya are the ones that have the nucleus. They have their, um, so that's actually what the word eukarya is. Eukarya um, means eukaryote means actually the one, a carrion is a nut. So a eukaryote is the one with a good nut. Um, whereas the prokaryote is the one before the nut. Um, so the first kingdom we are gonna look at is the protists. Um, they um, contain protozoans. Protozoans have a heterotrophic mode of nutrition, meaning that they eat bacteria and other protozoans. Some of them are animal-like. Um, most of them live in aquatic environments, and we usually characterize them by the mode of locomotion, because that's when when people first characterized them. They they that's what they saw, right? They saw them move, and they were like, "Ah, this is a flagellum," you know, that kind of thing. Um, and the one we're going to look at in class um, is going to be uh, euglena. Um, euglena has been called a one-celled plant and a one-celled animal. Um, it's been called a one-celled plant because it contains chloroplasts, so clearly it can do photosynthesis. Um, but it also has a flagellum, and a flagellum is this whip-like projection here that makes it allows it to move. And when you look at eukarya under the microscope, you actually see them. You actually have to chase them. 
Um, so you, you have a hard time trying to get them to the higher magnifications because, yeah. Um, and then we have algae. You find those in fresh and salt water. Uh, they're photosynthetic. Uh, there's lots of different body forms. Um, they're single cells, they're filaments, they're spherical con um, specializations. They can reproduce asexually or with spores or sexually. Um, and the one we're going to look at as an example is Volvox. Um, Volvox is a colony of algal cells, which uh, there's like 500 of them that's, that swim in a gel gelatinous matrix. They swim as a unit. Uh, these daughter colonies, they're on the inside. Um, and they can have sexual reproduction that actually relies on mating types. And on the outside here, you can barely see it. They have these little cilia that allow them to move. And here you see how they're all connected with each other. They all have, you know, they, they, they swim together and they communicate together about what they're going to do. Last but not least, we're going to look at the kingdom fungi today. Um, fungi are interesting because they have external digestion. Um, they are from the unicellular, which are the yeasts, um, or they can be multicellular. They have hyphae. Um, hyphae are networks of filaments. And lots of hy hyphae together produce what's called the mycelium. And that's what, you know, that's, they live, they, they exist as a my, uh, mycelium. There's about 100,000 different species, about a third of them um, have mutually beneficial associations with other creatures. Uh, about a third of them are decomposers or saprophytes. And about a third of them are parasites. Now with regards to the mutually beneficial association, one of the things that we actually think is there are fungi all over the ground uh, underneath of us that communicate with the trees and provide the trees with the nitrogen that the trees need. Um, and in, con in, in, in return, uh, the trees provide the fungi with the carbon um, that the fungi need. One of the most famous yeasts is Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is used in baking and brewing. Um, and it takes sugars, for example, glucose, and turns them into ethanol and CO2. In baking, um, the CO2 makes the dough rise, um, whereas the ethanol allow, uh, is allowed to evaporate. Um, potatoes, eggs, or sugar accelerate the growth because they provide more food. In wine and beer fermentation, uh, you end up catching the ethanol. Um, and wine and beer doesn't get any, get any uh, with, with fermentation, you can't get any higher uh, alcohol percentage than like, I think it's 12 or 13 percent. Um, because other, um, after that, it kills the, it kills the yeast. So the, the higher percentage alcohol has to be done with uh, distilling. Um, different strains of Saccharomyces are used for different beers. So um, there's Ceramyces cerevisiae, which is an ale, um, a Ceramyces um, ce um, cerevisiae uvarum is a lager. Um, they're isolated from the skin of grapes. They're extremely well studied because um, they're very easy to handle. Um, they're eukaryotes, so they do a lot of the same things we do. Um, and we also use them to, um, to clone things. We, we have, we have them do our bidding. Um, they can uh, live as haploid cells. Um, when they're haploid cells, then they then they reproduce by mitosis. Um, and if stress happens, then they're they're just dead. Um, they can also be uh, diploid cells, um, and they can still do mitosis. Uh, but if they get stressed out in that situation, and they do meiosis and produce haploid spores. Um, these haploid spores, then after they survive the stressful event, um, they um, mate. They can then mate with each other. And they, um, fungi, a lot of fungi, and Saccharomyces cerevisiae is one of them, um, have mating types. Next, we're going to be looking at mushrooms and bracket fungi. Um, so they uh, reproduce asexually, sexually, or with spores. Uh, when you look at a mushroom, the mycelium actually grows below the surface. And what you see, what we look at um, uh, as, a, as a mushroom, where we say, there's a mushroom growing there. That's actually just the fruiting body um, with, with the stalk and the cap. 
And the, the, what's under the cap is called the gills. Uh, most of them um, are with uh, mycorrhizal uh, symbiosis with plants. Um, and uh, they, they tend to break down the wood, which is where the mycelium grows in, inside of the tree. Um, then we have down here, we've got some bracket fungi. Uh, bracket fungi are primarily parasitic, meaning that they obtain food from the host. Um, some of them are saprophytic, which means that they uh, feed on decaying matter. And again, the mycelium growth grows in the trunk of the tree. Lichens are a symbiotic relationship between a fungus and a green algae or a blue-green algae. Um, you're going to look at a couple of different types of uh, lichens in the lab. Um, and we use them, you know, to color things and reindeer use them as food. Now, last but not least, I wanted to tell you about fairy rings. Um, sometimes you see these circular areas, areas that are just a little, um, a little um, darker than the rest of them. That's because they're more fertile than the rest of them. And the way that they, um, they come about is with, actually with, with mushrooms or fungi. Um, so every, you know, there was probably a fungus in, uh, in the first year that was in the middle. Um, and then the mycelium grew out in a circular pattern in all directions. And then at the end of the year, it, the, the mushroom fruited on the outside of the circle. And then the mycelium grew out again and it fruited on the outside of the circle. And then when, the, when those fruiting bodies die, um, that's basically the fertilizer that makes it more uh, nutritious on the outside than other places. Um, and that's all I wanted to talk about today. And you should go on now to the lab section.